In the name of the Divine Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. God sent forth his Son, made of a woman. I bring you greetings from Cambridge, and in particular from my home parish of the Assumption of Our Lady in Halton. I'm honoured by Father Andrew's kind invitation to preach here, especially on the festival day of the Assumption. But I do have to begin with an apology. It's an apology for a service, a sermon which is so much a game of two halves. You'll see what I mean. There was a time when I had never heard of St. Mary's Bourne Street. My Anglo-Catholic roots are all in Oxford. The great London churches in those days were unknown to me. But I had friends in Oxford who went on to be London musicians, and one of them was Paul Brough's predecessor, David Trendle. I came to know Trendle very well, because I sometimes sang for him and for Andrew Carwood at Christchurch in the vacations. And rather unexpectedly, we became friends. We used to dine together. We even went to concerts in London together, which caused some surprise among his London friends. Let the reader understand. <laughs> and it was through Trendle that I came to hear and learn of an exotic, legendary creature, a creature of which over years I heard much, but which it felt to me at the time I was destined never to encounter for myself. But I waited through long years getting a doctorate and a theology degree, and after that, Westcott House and ordination. And then I was at the Eddington Festival of Music Within the Liturgy, invited soon after my ordination at Andrew Carwood's suggestion onto the ministry team. And that was when the exotic, legendary creature became a reality. I met Paul Brough. <laughs> it was in the pool room at the Lamb in the village of Eddington. I don't know what they call it now, but in those days it was the Lamb. And Bruff was there, and he was Bruff. He really was truly, literally fabulous. And then we had this conversation, a, a tour de force, as it always is, and then suddenly the vision was over. Like the poet Catullus says, Lucimus Satis, we've had enough fun. He politely excused himself and moved on. Now, you'll be glad to know, um, you don't have to turn around to check this, this is a sermon for the Feast of the Assumption and not an obituary for Brown. <laughs> <laughs> but he is retiring from serving here, and he's doing so while he's at the peak of his powers and the highest refinement of his art. And he's chosen this day for that retirement which I think tells you all you need to know about him. So I'm going to offer one fragment of the gospel on behalf of us all to honour his service here to Mary and to her son. Simply this. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Well done. If you need any other word than that, let it be a single word of Latin. A word which, like our English word, farewell, means both goodbye and be strong. Vale, frate, delectissime. Now I turn to this festival day. The bodily assumption of the Blessed Mary is not exactly high profile in the theological thinking of most of the Church of England. Some of our brothers and sisters of tender conscience may be worried because it is not explicitly mentioned in scripture. Well, I am a plain Bible-believing Christian, and I believe in the assumption. And I do so for three reasons. The first is logical. Once you've believed in the existence of God, nothing else about the faith should ever strike you as problematic. I take that as a given that needs no more argument from me here. The second reason why I believe in the Assumption of Our Lady is historical. 
Sometimes silence speaks louder than words. Think for a moment, what if? What if the assumption hadn't happened? If Mary had died and been buried? Veneration of the saints was practiced from Christianity's earliest days and the powerful prayers of the saints extended far beyond death. So every part of their physical existence was treasured, even in death. A scrap of clothing, a lock of hair. If Mary had gone the way of all flesh and been buried, people would have flocked to her tomb. They would have guarded it and fought over it and claimed it for their own. Later, they would have taken relics from it, a bone or a fragment. Every atom they felt charged with spiritual power but no one did. No one claims such a relic. There has never been a tradition or a trace of earthly remains. What about my third reason for believing? That rests on a perception which many of us take comfort from in these challenging days for Catholic Christianity. When we lose confidence in our leadership, when we fear that all the church's energy and effort is going into novelty schemes and not into supporting priests who want to pray and preach and visit and bring comfort to the broken. There is still this principle at work. And I've used a bit of Latin so far, one more bit won't hurt. Lex orandi, lex credendi. It means we learn to believe through what we pray. Ordinary people believed in the assumption from very early times, long before the church leaders caught up with popular devotion. Ordinary people cherished a love of our Blessed Lady and eventually the authorities followed in their wake. So I offer you those three reasons for trusting in Our Lady's assumption, logical, historical and devotional. That still leaves us with the question, so what? What difference does it make to all of us? I would say, as the plain Bible-believing Christian that I am, that it should make all the difference in the world because of what it tells us about the here and now, but also because of what it tells us of the life of the world to come. What does Mary tell us of the life of the world to come? She is assumed into the heavenly realm as firstborn among the redeemed. From the first moment of her conception, she is not there to make the rest of us feel inadequate and second best. She is there to make all of us sure that heaven is for us too and that from Mary we can find the way there. Now, what does Mary's assumption tell us about today? The ordinary people who came to pray and celebrate this day understood what made Mary so divinely graced. And I'd suggest to you that it was not her immaculate conception or the virginal conception of Christ, nor was it her life of obedience, suffering, joy, and service. All that mattered but none of it was the heart of the matter. Mary was uniquely graced because she was judged worthy to touch the stuff of God in the person of his own son, in Jesus Christ, incarnate, born and resurrected. There was nothing between them, hand to hand, flesh to flesh, heart to heart. And that contact with the stuff of God is what awaits us too. Not only in the world to come, but now, right now, in this lovely church and in this beautiful worship, which through the power of every sensual gift gives us a foretaste, touch, sight, smell and sound of heaven itself. Today we take to ourselves 
the sacred mysteries of the body and blood. And we follow Mary Hodigitria, the one who points the way. Amen.